to welcome Ambassador Swani Hunt to give her keynote speech. Ambassador Hunt is the founder of the Women and Public Policy Program at Harvard University. In the mid-1990s, Dr. Hunt represented President Bill Clinton as ambassador to Austria, where she hosted negotiations to stop the genocide in the neighboring Balkan states. Ambassador Hunt has worked in 60 countries with, with thousands of women leaders. She is founder of the Institute for Inclusive Security, a major force in the field of women, peace and security. Her bold goal is changing who makes decision about war and peace. She has authored columns and articles for the New York Times, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, CNN, and provided commentary for numerous television networks. Her four books deal with foreign policy implications drawn from the Bosnian War, as well as Rwandan woman, women's role in healing their countries after a horrific genocide. Without further ado, Ambassador Swani Hunt, the floor is yours. Thank you. I've looked forward to this a lot and I've already learned. I've already learned a lot um, just watching your faces and and but especially picking up little things you were saying here and there that ring true very very much to me and um, when we were talking about putting this together Maria Teresa Gonzalez Esquivel is that, is that close enough and and then my my good friend um, Raja we were we were talking about how uh, what I should be saying and and um, basically what Raja said to me is Raja didn't use these words, but she said something to the effect of, you know, there's a new thing out there that just invented. It's called Wikipedia and people can look there and they can. And another new thing is the Internet and they can look there and they can uh, see what you've written. They can read, you know, all the your opinions about this and that related to 1325, which I'm very, very happy to talk about. But but I'm really taken in particular, uh, Rachel, what you said about uh, the George Floyd experience etc and it just it makes me really in my mind hone in on the fact that what we consider foreign policy is someone else's domestic policy and vice versa in other words we tend to think of these places these other places ambassador you're on mute again mm. there you go What's the last thing you heard me say? What we consider foreign policy is someone else's domestic policy. That whoever said that is really brilliant. But yes, thank you. Um, OK, so when you think about. Um, it's not about what's happening over in another place. It in terms of um, the, the real true life experience, because that other place isn't an other place. To the people who are there it's what it's what they see when they wake up in the morning and um and in the same way what you were saying rachel is true in our experience in the u.s um what is 1325 in the u.s we can talk about that in you know later but but what we know is that we are shaped by what we see when we um when we're going to sleep at night when we're getting up in the morning i i live just um about a 30 minute walk from the uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza from the church uh, where our former president held up the Bible, I think upside down and said, you know, this is, you know, we're here to uh, protect ourselves from these scary people um, and these you know, black people who are gonna destroy our neighborhoods, et cetera. That's part of our reality. That's, that's when, we, when we start talking about, are we gonna have a democracy given what's happening in our political system where the the three branches of government are, are being um, broken down those lines between them what does that mean what does it mean when we uh, start making it difficult for people to vote we say well that's our domestic policy but no that is foreign policy that's somebody else's foreign policy as they're looking at us and when we have gone through that experience here i will just say personally the one the one thing I have held on to that I think not no one else in my family anyway would have 
because they can talk about politics, politics. What I'm seeing is, oh, this looks familiar. Oh, oh, I get it. I get what misinformation was. That's what Milosevic did for 20 years. That's what Goebbels did. You know, that's that wasn't a ploy of Putin at all. You know, I, I see that. Oh, I see what's happening here in terms of the dividing of people. That's what happened in Rwanda. Oh, I see what you know it. it we are one. We are one. And until we really grasp that, we cannot be, we cannot be one for each other. And it's very, very important. For me, the last three years, I've just moved to DC. It has made it much, much more critically important that we understand 1325. That that is not about these other places, these other examples. I mean, I can tell you, here are the eight reasons why you have to have women, you know, um, in these positions, et cetera. But you know what? Go to Wikipedia. You know, they'll tell you what I think about these things. Um, what I think we should be talking about is real life. That's that's really what I have to offer. And and so my real life is I grew up um, in Dallas, Texas, very conservative. My father was an ardent, ardent anti-communist. He was determined to save the um, the Republic USA from the mistaken enemies of freedom. You notice how that rolls off my, my tongue because I heard it a lot. He was 61 when I was born. Um, and he succeeded in saving the Republic USA from the mistaken enemies of freedom. I mean, you know, so, but he did it with a great deal of zeal. And that's what we heard about all the time. And it was a real, you know, that was real. That was real. There were horrible things happening um, after World War II in terms of what was happening with the Soviet Union and, and the repression, et cetera. But I grew up in a family where you take it on, you don't even ask, um, you don't even ask, uh, how do I do it? You certainly don't ask, can I do it? The question is, does it need to be done? Like, do we need to save the Republic of USA from the mistaken enemies of freedom? Well, yes, we do, right? So so you just do it. And even though I can you know, look back and think, oh my gosh, what was that like? You know, growing up in that setting where there were communists everywhere. I couldn't go to I couldn't go to any school except for Southern Methodist University because and it was 10 minutes from the house. And he said it's run by communists, too. But um, but at least, you know, you're 10 minutes from the house and I can look over, and see what's happening. But, you know, my dream was to come to Harvard and I couldn't because, you know, that had been run by communists for quite a while. And, and by the way, it's what an irony that I end up there um, teaching for 20 years. Uh, and creating the Women in Public Policy program. I mean, I, I went and I um, soon after I got there, I was asked to speak and uh, it was to Radcliffe, which as you know, um, girls weren't allowed to uh, sully Harvard. So there was Harvard and there was Radcliffe, right? And uh, so I was speaking to Radcliffe, which is the sister school for Harvard. And I told him about um, dad not letting me come to Radcliffe when I wanted to because you all were run by uh, communists. And he thought, and this is someone from the back of the room shouted, we were. <laughs> I love it. Oh, well, Dad, you know, you were onto something. <laughs> so you, know, you just have to look back. It's horrible to, when you're living it, but you have to look back and say, you know, it's who I am. And I think that's what I would say to people on this call is all of those experiences, all of those experiences, they are who you are. They are who you are and never, ever, ever run away from the worst things that have happened to you. They are who you are. And you're not doing your work that that means so much to you. You're not doing it in spite of having had this horrible experience, having been, having been attacked, having been verbally or physically. You're not doing it in spite of that. You're not doing it in spite of this failure or that failure. They are who you are. And if you're strong, it's you're strong because of those experiences, not in spite of those experiences. Um, that's what I learned when I talked to, gosh, Roger, I don't know how many hundreds of, of women I've talked with and done lots and lots of, of videos. And uh, so, so I would have them to, to look at and over and over, I've written these four books, I don't know, maybe 1500 pages. And to do these books, I would go in to a place and I would just 
say, hey, you know, what happened? So it could be Bosnia. We chose 26 women as different as possible. Old, you knew, old, new, old young, like very young teenager, a uh, woman who had been in Auschwitz. Right. Uh, very, very poor uh, on a farm with two chickens and someone who um, made her way uh, out of the country by selling jewels. Right. Family jewels or um, people, uh, Muslim, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Jewish and atheist all together, you know, they didn't know each other. But I would go and I would set up the camera and I would say, I was interested in um, what have you done to sustain the peace? Because it was very soon after the peace agreement. And things were dicey and and they couldn't they couldn't talk about that without telling me what had happened. It's really interesting. It surprised me. Um, it makes sense now that they could not say, here's what I'm doing now without saying, you have to understand what has happened. And so I said, you know, cameras on and they would talk and talk and talk about the madness and the losses and the fears and the huge, huge hardships, three and a half year siege, not knowing you know, 100,000 people killed out of, um, out of a population of 4 million. And just, it's the same story that we hear in Syria. It's the same story in Rwanda. It's the same story in Guatemala, whatever. But but seeing how those were their lives, that was their lived experience, the terrible compromises they made that they never thought they would have to make before. You know, do I, do I let this baby be alive? Do I toss the baby off, off the balcony? Because the baby's crying and we're hiding. It's, it's that kind of situation that people never, ever, ever, ever imagine. And then how do you live with that? So everyone on this call has your stories. And um, my dad was, I would say, a major force for, for, um, for bad. It's easy. I don't want to say evil, but for bad. He did a huge amount of damage. Um, in this country as he was saving the Republic USA from the mistaken enemies of freedom. Um, but that's part of who I am. It's part of my experience. I learned a lot. The person I learned the most from, though, was my mother, who was my father's mistress. You're starting to get a picture of the, the characters, right? Uh, so dad had, um, Roger asked me to talk some about how I got to this. Dad had, um, a wife and he never went to school. He was brilliant, sort of one of, you know, savant kind of brilliant, never went to school and um, married. And he had, he was a, a gambler. He was a professional gambler. Um, there are such things, you know, people who like, that's where their income comes from is they're really good at cards. And, and that was part of the way his, his brain that was one of the, I won't even say skills. It was one of part of who he was. He could know what the cards were. And so uh, he won um, in a card game, a poker game. He won the largest oil field in the world at the time because it was the pre Middle East. And that's why he ended up having as much power as he did. And so he had his ch six children and he had another mistress and they had four children and then they broke up and then he picked up my mom. He was the age of her father who had died when she was young. So it's one of these stories that we've all read about in terms of um, when we read novels, it, novels are written based on something, right? And so my father, who was 30 years older than my mother, picked her up, she gets pregnant, she starts lying to her family back on the farm. She was raised on a farm. I mean, it's, it's a very sad story. I'm the youngest of all of those children. So I'm number 14 of all the children and a um, lot of, lot of pain in there. Um, my mother didn't have any source of income and we're talking about in the fifties now, forties and fifties. And, and uh, she didn't know what she was going to do if she left him. We lived five minutes from his, from his family. And, um, and so she stayed and it was tough and she didn't have, he, he didn't have any 
I keep, I know we had an old car and, and we had, it wasn't old when we got it and he paid for the house. But I, I mean, it, it, but it wasn't, there wasn't any clear way that she wasn't like on an allowance or something. So, but she would save up money that she would get here and there. And what was so striking about mom is when I watched what would happen to that money, it would always end up, always end up in somebody else's purse or in, in their home, or keeping someone alive or or getting some doc, some medical care because she was the most generous person I have ever known. And so all of that comes together and I can say, oh, you know, I'm so sad I had this, this family situation. You know, I mean, if I'm going to be sad about that, I need to open my eyes and get on an airplane, start looking around, or I could go just into the, um, uh, I could go over to Southeast Washington, you know, or, I mean, take a look at what the way people are having to live. So bringing that all together, and I started working on domestic policy and uh, in, in Colorado, I started working on homelessness because my family has a lot of mental illness. I grew up with a brother who was paranoid schizophrenic and I was trained as a chaplain in a mental hospital, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what I did. And um, I was able, to, my sister and I were able to start a private foundation. And what did we focus on? We focused on public education and we pu focused on uh, women, getting women um, out of poverty. And we focused all the kinds of things that are this not that leads to imprisonment and leads to despair and leads to um, such hardship in our country. Our country's a mess for those of you who aren't Americans. I, well, I guess you know that because you you see it uh, in movies. But when you have a, a you know a quarter of the children in um, in your country, in the richest country in the world, who are in poverty, I mean, come on, come on, what's that about? Right. Uh, so when I say it's a mess, it's not just the hardship that people live in, under. It's the fact that the people who aren't living with that hardship are part of allowing that hardship. So anyway, so then I met a woman who um, she was coming through Colorado because her husband was the um, governor of Arkansas, a state nearby. He was going to run for president. And uh I wasn't particularly interested. I never did done anything with presidential politics, but she was really she was really something. And we got together in a in a uh, a dark cafe that that had been closed, but we just wanted some you know, some quiet time. And we got to know each other. We were talking about public education and poor kids in the United States. And out of that came a relationship, a very important relationship, at which point Hillary Clinton, when she became first lady, said, I want her to be in the administration talking about me. And that's how I ended up going to Austria. And the reason Austria made sense was because there was a terrible war going on. And um, it would be better, I could do more actually in Vienna in terms of that war than I could have in Sarajevo because the war was being run from Washington. One of the ways we do things, which is not so great. So the war was being run from Washington in terms of the US involvement. And um, the UN was not doing a good job there. Let's just face it, lots and lots and lots of promises of we're going to intervene. We're not going to let this happen. This is a safe haven. This is, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the UN couldn't figure out how to, to be meaningfully helpful in stopping the genocide. The US wouldn't. We had midterm elections coming up. Can you believe I'm saying this? Can you believe I'm saying that we didn't intervene to stop a genocide because we had midterm elections coming up? and the people in the United States uh, were not interested in stopping a genocide. I mean, I mean you're getting the real deal, right? Because otherwise, look at Wikipedia and the internet and you'll get the other story. Um, so that's the view, that was, that was the eyes in which I went into that work in Vienna. I made 22 trips around um, 
Eastern Europe. The wall had just fallen in Berlin. Uh, my father had succeeded in saving the Republic USA from the mistaken enemies of freedom. And with the implosion of communism there, there was all kinds of drama about would these countries turn east or west. And so I was all over the place, but particularly the collapse of Yugoslavia. Well, the, the, you have to understand that the collapse of Yugoslavia was within that context, that whole context of what was happening with Eastern Europe, the, the wall falling, etc. So we just had massive confusion at that time. Um, before I left, I pulled together a meeting. I called it Vital Voices, Women in Democracy. I'd made these 22 trips to all these capitals, met with women, not just capitals, in 36 countries. Pulled together delegations and went to the uh, other embassies, which I wasn't supposed to do. One ambassador isn't supposed to mess around with another ambassador's territory. It's kind of like dogs lifting their legs or something. You're supposed to get permission. And um, if you quote me, I'll deny I said that, of course, everything's uh, being recorded, so I don't know what to do about that. Uh, so I went around and I said, okay, bring a delegation of eight, 10, 12 people, and we'll have a three-day meeting. And I said um, to the first lady, um, Hillary, can you come over? We really want you to come and keynote this. And because that meant a whole lot to the Austrians. We were the lone superpower. Remember, I mean, Russia had just imploded. And, and so um, she did. Vital Voices, Women in Democracy. That was really, really the big piece that led in my work to, in many ways, to uh, my work on 1325. Because when we ha when we brought those women together, they weren't coming out of war zones per se, but they were coming out of some real dramatic hardship. I wrote a piece for Foreign Affairs, and I looked at what was happening in with the women after the fall of communism, Russian communism. We all expected that there was like everyone's in a cage. You open up the cage doors and out everyone comes with their freedom. And you know, um, the vice president of the Czech Senate, Yara Mozarova, who came to Vital Voices, she said, Swanee, it's not how it works. She said, you open up the cage door. The first ones who run out are the predators. People are still in the cage. They're looking out there and they're seeing predators. And I thought, wow. This, it, this just doesn't happen. It doesn't just unroll like it ought to unroll. And that's when I really came to understand the role of the UN. I just started to understand it there. The UN isn't about, you know, gee, we didn't intervene, you know, or we screwed up here and we screwed up there. All of those are true, by the way. But it's also about having that distance to say, you know what, this isn't going to just naturally turn out the way you think it's going to. We are going to have to get in there as the United Nations. We're going to have to be as smart as we know how to be. We're going to have to pull people together, all different kinds of perspectives. It's a very messy way to work. It's a very inefficient way to work, and it's the only way to work. That's how you have to work, it's by pulling together as many perspectives as you can. So. That's what happened in Vital Voices. All these different perspectives for three days, these women exchanging their ideas. It'd be a woman in, um, in Warsaw saying to a woman from Washington, do you have any, any um, laws on domestic violence? We don't have anything and I'm a judge now. Judge used to be meaningless. Now suddenly, suddenly it's meaningful because it's not a communist state. And so she said, do you have some laws you can send me? And I mean, it was that kind of thing. Just this very basic, but also the encouragement. So I watched that. I just watched it and watched it. How this interchange among the women was so vital and it was taking us into a new place. Then I get this call. And it's by it's from the Dean of the Kennedy School of Government, 
which is the Harvard I never got to go to. And um, and he was saying, well, come now. I thought, well, why is he wanting this? And he said, he said, <laughs> he said, I have four sisters. <laughs> Maybe it's five. I don't know. He said, but they are so mad at me. They are so mad at me because we aren't doing anything for women. And he said, if I'm going to have peace in my family, we have got to have a, a, the, essentially something for women. And I saw what you did with Vital Voices. Will you come do something for the Kennedy School? So I did. And we created the Women in Public Policy Program. And what's interesting about, and Joe won't mind my making fun of him like that, by the way. Um, what's interesting about that is um, this is the person who coined the words, as you know, soft power. He had been the Assistant Secretary of Defense. Right? And what he was saying is, this isn't working. This is not working. It's not always bombs and bullets. Yeah, you've got to have that capacity for the hard power, but we are missing something huge. What we're missing is the ability to persuade, the ability to, to hear each other, to make the connections, the, the ability to actually behave in such a way that people will want to behave like you. You know, you, you don't just you don't just have a resolution and says, well, here's our you know, human rights standards. It matters how you behave, which has been some of the tragedy of the last four years with the United States. It didn't really matter what the standards were that we were saving, saying um, that we, it wasn't about what was on paper. We were behaving so badly. You know, it, the behavior matters. So, I'm looking at all of this, the soft power business, and he's saying, you know, what's going on? How, what did you learn in Vienna? Let's talk, let's talk, let's talk. Wonderful guy, if you ever get a chance to meet Joe Nye. Um, so, I tell him a story. And I'll stop very soon. I, um, but I'll tell you the story. And that is in 1994, I mean, Bosnia was just, I mean, we, no one could see an end in sight. You know, it's so interesting afterwards and you say, oh, well, there was a three and a half year siege. Nobody knew it was going to be three, three and a half years. They thought it was going to be maybe three days or maybe 30 years. You, you don't have any clue when you're in the middle of it, right? And so people were trying to get, you know, what, how do we end this? How do we end this? How do we end this? And as you know, it had been, become really clear that this was a power play by Slobodan Milosevic, who wanted to create greater Serbia, and 90% of the human rights abuses were committed by Serbs who were trying to terrify people. So that, as they would say, you know, Muslims go back to go back to Turkey, you know? And, um, and there were all these intrigues and, you know, different parts, different players getting together, we'll divide up. The, the country this way, we'll push them out. We'll, you know, we'll we'll get them to flee because we're going to put the old people from nursing homes. are going to pull their eyeballs out and make them swallow their eyeballs, and then everyone's going to scream and run away. I mean, it was just like it was horrible. I mean, you can't. It, it was like 50 years earlier, you know, with the concentration camps. So I ended up hosting negotiations. You're about to meet my cat. You want to meet my cat? She's just crawled into my lap. There he is. Okay. You can say, honey. All right. So, um, so I end up hosting these negotiations. 14 days of negotiations, two rounds. It's um, Bosnian Croats, which also included some. Oh, the, you know what? It's so complicated when you talk about the different republics because everybody's mixed up and, you know, et cetera. But, those of you who know the, the scene, Bosnian Croats and the Bosniaks, which is the Muslims, and they're getting together to form a federation so that they can face off against the Serbs. Because the three-way war is very, very, very hard to manage. Two-way is you can start doing something. So they're using my office. I've got maps spread out on the floor, on my desks, et cetera. They're drawing up the country. Here's how we'll do it. Here's blah, 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 blah. The, um, across the, the hall is the dining room, the ambassador's dining room. There are these very, very bleary-eyed um, 
guys who haven't been out of the country in three and a half years. Right. And they are saying, I never will forget. I said, what can I get you? They said, we need a constitution. Could you get us a constitution? I said, no, God, what are you looking for? And they say, well, and they name some things. I said, well, look, you know, the Swiss, I think they have something really, I think they have something you should look at. So I call the Swiss ambassador. We need to see your constitution. That's how Bosnia ends up with cantons. <laughs> because I mean, these inside stories are just crazy, you know? So anyway, they end up, everyone's kind of piecing this together. It's, it's very, you never know what's going to happen. But they come up with a federation. But 14 days in my office. So I fly over for the signing of the agreement. And in come the presidents, President Tuchman from Croatia. Of course, Croatia is saying that they're not involved in, in really fighting this war, but President Tuchman comes to sign the agreement. And President Zbigovic, you know, from the Muslim community, if you will, and, and President Clinton. And we're all gathered uh, at the White House to sign for the signing. And I look around. I think I was wearing red. I think I was wearing a red suit with some black buttons or whatever. The rest of the room, the rest of the room was gray suits. So the people who had been involved in the negotiations had all come over. And I, who had been so involved in my growing up with my mother, seeing the hardship and getting involved and, and working on women's empowerment and, and being a woman of ardent feminist like Hillary and I mean, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't notice. How is that possible? How is that possible? I didn't notice that there, no, there were no women there. Boy, did I learn a lot. It didn't go well. Bosnia's a mess. Um, the final negotiations were a year later at Dayton. It's not a good agreement. Uh, and they may go back into war now, read the New York Times. Um, there were no women involved. And the women I've written about, they say over and over, if we had been there, here's what we would have done differently in terms of those agreements. So I told Joe Nye this story, and then I'm going to stop. I told Joe Nye this story. We're sitting in the, um, the cafeteria and tell him about the gray suits. And he said, you follow that story. I think you have something there. And I went to the United Nations. And it was a meeting at um, UNDP, wherever, and I was telling the story. I said, how come there are no women involved in the negotiations in this country, that one, this one, that one, this one? How come there are no women? And then I start getting like real preachy, you know, like you should have women, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> And finally, this really nice guy said, Madam Ambassador, there aren't any women because the warlords won't allow women on their teams. And I said, well, why not? He said, because they're afraid they'll compromise. And I thought, bingo. What if that were true? What if that were true? We would have a different world. And so I have um, one thing led to another. I got to know Raja, put together these meetings, these colloquia, hundreds and hundreds of women from about 20 different conflict areas over the years, exchanging their stories. Um, Derek Bach, who was the president of Harvard, said, I love what you're doing. It's one of the most important things that's happened at Harvard in a decade. Uh, he said, but you really should focus just like on two conflicts or three conflicts and, uh, and really go deep. I said, no, that's not what I'm doing. This is about what's happening in the world. If I focus on Uganda and Guatemala, that people are going to say, oh, wow, yeah, you know, those those Ugandan women, they are unbelievable. And it's going to stop there, you know, or if I, they'll say the same thing about Guatemala. And I said, no, they people have to understand 
how broad this is. That this is a different phenomenon. And out of that came 1325. And no, I mean, not from me, the UN was developing 1325. And that was all happening. We were involved with that. And then we did this big, big meeting in 1999. And then Harvard, the Kennedy School became this uh, nexus of uh, activity of bringing these women together. And, and that, so then it became a real joint work of the collaboration and the research and the, um, the work with the policymakers. My view, and then I, will, I truly will stop. My view is that the real play here, if you'll forgive my um, casual language, the real play is not how do we get women trained? Please forgive me, but really, you know, how do we get women trained or how do we get women empowered? so they can do this or that. Women are trained, <laughs> you know, come on. They, they're the ones who are running their families. They're the ones who are running their communities. They're the ones who, who know what's going on. They're the ones who can work across the, the aisles, the lines. And they're the ones who have their fingers on the pulse. They, I mean, they're just, there's so many ways in which they are already the people who are ready to be at the table. The problem is not doing something for the women. The problem is the policymakers. That's the real play, is how do we get the policymakers to say, we are not going to have these negotiations unless we have 30, 40, 50% women on each side of that table. And you know what? We have the power to do that. We just don't do it. A lot of lip service. Wajma Fro in, in Afghanistan, we've worked for years and years and years. I, I went there in 98 during the Taliban um, and worked with hundreds of Afghan women. So the Afghan women were so, so outspoken about um, having to be at that table. So much lift service. Hillary Clinton was going, she was pulling out her hair, saying we've got to get them at the table, et cetera, et cetera. All the words, all the people saying, "Gee, you know, yeah, but you know, we got we got to make sure that everyone feels okay about that, you know." So, we have a, a royal, you know, catastrophe there, because we don't know how to do it. We really don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. UN doesn't know how to do it. Harvard University doesn't know how to do it. To get the policymakers really, really bought into this. And so have we made progress? Yes, but you're going to find all over the place those times like we just had with those negotiations. You know, I, I'm not ready at all to say 1325 has now prevailed. I mean, just wind the, wind the clock back a few months. How did that happen? Where was 1325? Last, one last sentence, because you asked about it earlier. I think it was Dean Smith. Um, Wajma and I wrote a piece that just ran uh, this week in the Boston Globe. And in it, she said, and she headed up a, a research institute. Uh, I've worked with her for 20 years in Kabul, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and she was saying, so look, this, by the way, this is the first draft it got taken out. Because she said, um, Look, you talk to us. You just talk to us about all the things that women could do here. So where were you? Where were you when we were saying over and over and over again, we have to be at the table? Where were you, policymakers? You know, you tell us, oh, well, you should be learning these resolutions. You should be studying this. You should be going to these workshops. She was talking about 1325. She said, where did it get us? So I'm here to talk to you about how wonderful the work is, how needed the work is, how there are so many policymakers who do understand it, but wow, we certainly are not at a place where we can count on 1325. It's gonna take every bit of muscle that we have. We had a lot, a lot of people on this call and there need to be about 10,000 fold who are 
re-energized or energized or you know, in this moment to keep pushing this issue. How's that for an ending? <laughs> I'm trying to say, you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> this is the aim for energizing and reactivating 1325. Thank you so much, Ambassador Hunt, for this personal, insightful, inspirational, and visionary remarks. Thank you for sharing with us like the hardship that you went through and sharing with hundreds of women leaders around the world that it is important to talk about our hardship in order to know exactly what is our goal, how we want to shape our future for us and for our community and for our families and for our countries. We have the opportunity now to interact with Ambassador Hunt Unfortunately, and fortunately, it's less than one hour because we, we heard from her more than what we intended to. So we have the opportunity now for a question and answer session. Your questions, comments, suggestions are all welcome. I want to stress that it is a conversation with Ambassador Hunt. It is a deep discussion and it is part of the learning process to advance the women, peace and security agenda locally, nationally and globally. So the floor is yours, like we will open it for people to mm, uh, give their questions and mm, uh, maybe I will check if we don't, please raise your hand if you have any questions or you can type it in the chat as well. So we have the first question from Professor David Wood, please the, the floor is yours. Great, and I'm just starting off to give our students and our guests time to, to think through all um, that deep experience that you, you convey to us. What do you think the, the women of, of Bosnia, of Croatia, of Serbia would have proposed that was different from Dayton? Because that's a really powerful point that if they'd been at the table, they would have said something different. Right, right. I really would love to understand that. Well, well they, they had several things to say. One is that all of this stuff about uh, there's such intractable hatred, you know, these different groups, they'll, you're never going to be able to get them together. They said, that is garbage. That is just garbage. They actually use stronger language than that. They said that is the Milosevic line that has been fed in order to keep the outside intervention outside. <laughs> so... Uh, they would have said, you have to understand, number one, that we are, in fact, a multicultural society. No, we are not going to separate this country and call half of it Republic of Serbska? Really? You're going to call the Republic of the Serbs? You're going to take Bosnia? You've got people who have attacked and killed all these hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of people? and committed ho such horrible abuses, and you're going to name half the country for them? Excuse me? And then you're going to say, oh, well, you have the right to return to your homes. Well, 60% of the housing has been destroyed. Well, that's going to be tricky. You know, how are you going to do that? And oh, but you can go back to your home, and well, there are other people living in it. If, if, they're, if it's still there, what are you going to do about that? Well, there isn't a plan for that, except to say on paper, um, right of return. And then where are you going to return to? You're going to return to your town, your city, where the mayor is the one who organized the atrocities, but has not been picked up. So, I mean, the order was all wrong. The concept was wrong about we're going to divide up. I mean, we were bullied. We were bullied and and we were out bullied you know, in that negotiation. So we ended up with a stagnant. Oh, oh, here's the other thing. So we're going to have because we have these three groups that can't work together. Right. And so. Um, so we're going to have three presidents. <laughs> this country is going to have three presidents and we have three, three prime ministers is going to have three foreign ministers. I mean, give me a break. So you end up with a completely paralyzed country. And these women are the ones who are trying to keep things going, trying to, you know, get the place to pull together again. 
you know, 30% of the marriages in the capital, 30% of the marriages were mixed marriages. Tell me about people who can't work together. They didn't even know what, what each other's, quote, ethnic group was, often. I heard, I heard this story all, all over. Um, a couple would be turning to each other and say, you know, I've never asked you, you know, like, I know this sounds strange, but I heard it too many times to not believe it. You know, like, like the the guns are or have started and the barricades are up. And they say, which which one are you? <laughs> you know. Anyway, so there was just this outsiders buying into a lie, and and the the result was a very very bad outcome. Thank you. So we have also Parish uh, have her hands up. Please go ahead. Thank you, Raja. Um, thank you so much, Ambassador Hunt, for your presentation. I have learned so much. Um, I'm really inspired from the part where you discussed that how important it is to own your own experiences and that define you, uh, who you are. Um, my question is, probably there are not a lot of people who have the type of background or experiences like yours, but I feel like your experience is unique and that really shows how your um, from your experience from your um, point of being inclusive your past made you more inclusive and it shows you how important it is for you to make sure that the decision making process is more um, representative in nature but my question is what would you advise to someone who does not have the experience like yours to still see inclusion or representativeness as an important and strategic element of the decision making process is when first of all when we talk about how unique my experience is so is yours every one of us every one of us and by and whoever you are you have strengths i don't have i can just tell you that you have strengths i ha don't have you have I mean, your whole life is knowledge that i don't have and i've wasted a heck of a lot of my time um you know and I, so, I mean, it's not like I've done things all right. So just keep that in mind. But to your point about what can any of us be doing to to build on build out that inclusion? Is that is that what you're saying? Is that what you're asking? Exactly. OK, I think it happens at the granular level and it happens at the at the broad level. But I think that um, we have to live in a way that we are constantly putting ourselves in situations where that are uncomfortable. And I go back to what Rachel was saying earlier about this time of this upheaval in the United States. We have to be right there in the mix because we're, we're dealing with an inclusion issue here. You know, I mean, we we have we have war going on here. We've had war going on in the in the inner city. We have so many more people killed. Uh, here because of race than we than in most of the countries that we think of being at war. Um, not just race, but poverty is just the whole thing. And we, but we don't think of ourselves as being at war. So the question is, how do I live my life? You know, in the immediate, just if you want to go into the immediate, the immediate, I would say um, this is December, whatever it is, maybe 5th. And, and I'm going to have I'm going to get really granular for you. I'm going to have some people over, right? So when I have these people over to sing Christmas carols, what am I thinking? I better be thinking. I got to make sure that half the people in that room are black or brown or Asian, and I'm not bringing together some white Christians, you know, who who all know the same carols. So it, it has to be a way of life. It has to be something we're living. The other piece of it is that if you're talking about inclusion, the way I focus on it is let's get not just what's happening at the granular level, but um, but let's look at these very, very strategic places like the negotiating tables, because what we know is that if women are involved in the creation of the peace agreement, what they do is well, there are a lot of things they work across the table much, much better. Than them and they don't dig in in the same way. It's hard if you're like the sole woman, right? But if you have like a 
group of women on each side, there, it's almost impossible to not get to a peace agreement in that kind of situation. So who decides who's going to be around the table? That's about inclusion. Well, that's not the warlords who are going to say, let's make sure we have 30% of the team being women, because then um, then we won't get everything we want, because there'll be this compromise. <laughs> you know? No, that's not how it works. So it takes us, it takes outsiders as well as the insiders to be very, very involved. And I think you need to get yourself into the strongest position you, you can be in. Uh, I don't know you, don't know your background, don't know your plans, et cetera. But if I were talking to someone, broadly speaking, who was coming to me, because this, I teach, right? I teach at the Kennedy School, have all these students, probably average age 28, maybe 30. You need to be out. Uh, you need to be out in the field. You need to be working. Uh, you need to have some exposure to what's happening at the micro level, the micro enterprise or the micro whatever. But you have to be connecting with the top level women. And the most important is you have to be connecting with the people who don't want to have the top level women involved. That's your key. That's your key, because 1325 has, well, I started to say hasn't arrived, 1325 arrived, but inclusive security, a sense of inclusion with, and that brings about security, that has not arrived. The great news is we have words on paper. The great news is we have concepts that are out there. Um, we were going to do a statement for the G8 during the Clinton administration, all about this. So. Um, and he was a big believer, President, because of Hillary. And um, so I was at the State Department and they were going to write up this, this great uh, statement for the G8. And the first, the first uh, page, I said, I'll do, I'll do the first draft. I said, no, no, no. The secretary said, no, no, no. Uh, Ambassador so-and-so will do the first draft and then you all work on it together. I said, no, I'll do the first draft. That's okay. And he said, no, no, so-and-so will do the first draft. So, you know, how many times am I going to say it? So. Um, so then the draft comes. First page of two pages is all about, oh, those poor women. Oh, my God. Do you realize what's happening to them? They're getting raped. They're all oh, so hard for them, all these things. So therefore, you know, so then second page. So therefore, they should have a place around the table. I said, I don't think that's how you do it. I don't think that they should be at the table because they've had such terrible things happen to them. I think they should be at the table because they're going to make this thing work. So if you are involved in those kinds of settings, which you do by very, very strategically building your career in a way that you will be at the side of the people who do not believe in this, but you're going to be there, you're going to be taking the notes and you're going to say, hey, you know, Dr. So-and-so, you know, Ambassador So-and-so. Um, I think you need to rethink that. And so you need to get yourself to the point where you're influencing the policymakers. And you can do it. You can also do it by just, you know, blocking the traffic. <clears throat> they all count. Defund the police. I mean, I don't care. But just, you know, <laughs> you've got to make noise. You've got to, you've got to really lean into this. So diversity, inclusion, and equality should be in our daily life. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Jacqueline Nolan, have a question, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much. I was very um, impre impressed and just really touched actually by your talk. We, it affected me in a deep way. Um, I just want to pick up on something you said um, about how the first people in the cage who run out are the predators. And that really struck me. And um, the idea of the cage interested me because it's a perception, it's an assumption there that we perceive the cage in the same way. So I'm just wondering how in a situation like that do you get to define the cage? Because I can also imagine, I can completely understand when the Soviet Union imploded, you know, it was a free for all and, and there was all kinds of exploitation on all kinds of levels. 
But I can also imagine there were a lot of people from inside that cage, including women, who actually maybe had a, a good life. And I, I now know, I mean, I mean, looking back, we now we now know that there's a lot of nostalgia for that old life because what came in its place didn't didn't offer them what uh, didn't reach the expectation. But anyway, just getting back to the core of my question, if you're going in there, how do you define the cage? Well, that's such I mean, you you put your finger on it because let's take it someplace else, Jacqueline. How do we define the cage here? How do we, how do we define the cage uh, at the US Congress? I mean, it, it's very real. What you're saying, if you if you want to talk to a group of people, they'll give you a very different cage than the other people will. And one of the things that I've been told recently is, well, you know, because I do all kinds of work besides this, I, and you can't do this political work with women on the Republican Democratic uh, sides, bringing them together because the times are so rough. The times, I mean, we've just never seen anything like this. All the hand wringing, oh dear, you know. I said, yes, we have. It was called Gettysburg. It was the Civil War. We are still here. But anyway, it's all, but yeah, but this isn't a time when women can do. I said, come on. So we're saying to Hutu and Tutsi women, look, you have got to figure this out. You have got to get together and put together a new a new society. You've got to figure out how to get your land rights. You've got to put get, get those 800,000 prisoners out of out of uh, the prison, um, get them back in functioning, et cetera. We didn't say, uh, you know, you all have been through such a hard time. You know, it just, we we understand why you can't do this. You know, we'll check with you later. You know, that, that's what we're saying to ourselves in the United States. Oh, it's just too hard a time. I think, oh, come on. You know, because that cage is, if, when it's right around you, it seems so valid. To understand it, but when you look at it from a distance, you say, "Wait a minute! What is a cage? A cage? A cage? It's it's a construct. That's all it is. It's, that's all it is. It, it's it's in your imagination. So you have to like break out of it. And um, and that's what Yara Mozarova would say at, at the Czech Senate. And that's what she did. You know, she said, "We're just going to push through. We're we're going to say." The predators are out there. The cage door opened. The predators went out. You know what? That didn't work. So forget the cage idea. Let's let's come up with another one. You know, I think that's part of it, Jacqueline, is to start with saying, oh, the cage, that's somewhat something someone else described and defined. And, you know, we all pretend like there's a cage. We're asking all these people in these other places, you know, you know get it together. You Come on, women. Well, like, why don't we? we? We should know how that feels. So I'll take maybe two or three questions at a time, and then like I will give you the floor, Ambassador Hunt, if it's okay with you. So I saw Kayle Jensen have uh, written her question. Could you could you say it, uh, Kai? Sure. Uh, thank you, you, Ambassador Hunt, uh, for the talk today. Uh, it's very enlightening. Um, so you said earlier that no one knows exactly how to promote action regarding including more women in negotiations and peace building. Um, my question was, what part of this barrier is due to cultural norms and what part of this is dealing with political incentive? Um, can you go in, into more detail on the barriers you have faced to promote inclusion on the negotiation table? Yeah, yeah. I, the one thing I would say is you got to be really, 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 really careful about the whole cultural norm thing because that is an excuse that's used. I mean, how many times did we hear, well, you can't have women in the Kosovo assembly. We know you got the quota, but the women in, um, because they're Muslim and, you know, 90% and, and, um, and they won't, you know, they don't that's not their role is to be in the public arena and i said well you know, and i was asked to come actually to to work with women to get them to run so did and and then asked to come back and help them come up with a strategic plan because in fact they did run and in fact they did win and in fact they made a difference and the same thing happened in multiple places i've been you know and 
including working with women in Belarus and working with women, I mean, anywhere, right, really. Um, they're always these, the, the first thing, oh, I have been, I, I worked and did like a 12 country swing. I know that sounds like an odd way to say it, but that's how it felt. <laughs> you know, I was just going from here to here to here to here. And there's something about doing it all at the same time and being able to ask the same question to the groups. Because in each one I was working with, um, either either I was at a university or I was working with the women leaders coming up with strategic plans. The only thing, only thing those 12 countries had in common, the only thing was, uh, um, it's six words. Well, it's the first one. Well, in our culture, women can't, and then fill in the blank. It always started with, in our culture, like like the rest of the world can do it, but in our culture, we can't do it. And you just have to say, well, thank you for sharing, and <laughs> I'll just go past it, because I'm just not going to buy into that. Like, what is culture? My, my life is really, really different from my grandmother's life. When did that happen? What do you mean? Well, like, was it yesterday? Was it? A year ago was it 40 years ago when did that happen when did it change well there isn't a when it, it, it's it's nanoseconds that so when you say well in our culture that is a construct culture is there you're the person who's changing it that's the whole point the culture is being changed right this second because i'm speaking and you're listening and then you're speaking and i'm listening and we are changing the culture so I say you have to put the cultural piece aside. You have to be, you don't be stupid about it, right? You have to constantly be taking it in and factoring because there are people who will use the culture issue as the reason that they can kill other people or that, you know, or this won't work because of the culture. So, um, so understanding the culture norm and also making sure that it is not an excuse for less inclusive processes. Thank you. We will have another question from Mansoor Franchbar. Hello, Madam Ambassador. Thank you so much for your nice presentation. Uh, basically, I'm from Afghanistan, but I live now in New York. My question is that, as you, as you may, as you know, that uh, what's going on in Afghanistan and for the past two years, actually, there were peace negotiations going on and women in Afghanistan tried much actually to be in part of those discussions. To some extent, they could not do it. Several factors were involved. And you see now the situation, the Taliban is in control of Afghanistan. But still women are fighting. What is your overall uh, overview of the situation? And what do you recommend for civil society organizations or women activists actually? What role they could play now actually? to try to protect women's rights under the Taliban regime or completely stand against them overall, what would you advise? Thank you so much. Yeah, well, I do want to say something because I was, as you can imagine, quite involved in this whole issue of women and getting to the peace talks, et cetera. And I want to say something about leadership. And we had dr drastically failed leadership on our side. And the fact that we had uh, someone who was put in charge of the talks who was not committed to inclusion. I mean, I, leadership matters. Leadership matters. And, but that's the example that I'm trying to say is to get, it, it, the real play is the policymakers. It's not, are there great women? We gotta make sure we have great women around. The women are there. And I haven't been in a country where there weren't great women who are ready and who could lead, right? It's the policymakers. So I see that as the tragedy. And in terms of now, the women in Afghanistan, they are a force. They are incredible force. And when I look at their power, because they have emerged, well, first of all, because the US used the excuse of women under the Taliban as the the uh, excuse to go in to Afghanistan, right? And blow things up. Okay, so we know that. So we have a big investment in that. So um, so we 
we spent a huge amount of time and trouble and money, et cetera. You know all that in terms of education. It worked. That part worked. But what we end up with now is these spectacular women who know how to lead, who have been leading. They've been in the ministries. They've been in civil society. They're the attorneys. They're on the courts. They're, you know, they're running the place, or they were. And so then they have to flee. And what I noticed, uh, Munser, is it kept being in the news all about the women, the women, the w- poor women. We've got a oh, terrible bit about the women, you know. But, but you know what? Those women, the real power is that they are iconic. They have connections that many heads of state would would give anything for because they have been on stage. They have been in they have been um, brought to the United States, women leaders from Afghanistan because we wanted to show off, right? We hear all the good things we've done, you know, United States. And so, Again, Mansur, if you quote me, I'm going to deny I said any of that. But um, um, so they have connections. They are going to be they're going to do OK. It's horrible time. It's a horrible time. The genie is out of the bottle. You can't get that genie back in the bottle. You can't you can't get millions of girls to unlearn how to read. No, so it's going to be awful, I believe that over time there's going to be taliban is going to discover that you cannot you cannot run a government without an owner's manual and they don't know where the owner's manual is you know it and they need these women but here's here's the piece that i don't want to get lost the experience of those women in the worst of what's happening to them is also happening in countries all over the world not every country, that's not what I'm saying, but in there are desperately, desperately terrible things going on for women in other countries. And those countries, we don't even know how to spell Chad. You know, I mean, it's, some people don't know how to spell UN. I mean, it's just, you know, it just, we are so isolated. And as we watch the, this whole experience of the Afghan women, we need to be thinking, oh, now I get it. This must be what I was hearing about years ago in terms of Nigeria or years ago in terms of another place and another place and another place, because this isn't really uh, just about Afghan women. It's about what's happening to women all over the world. It's, It's about starting out in that position where you are property and you can be bought and you can be sold and you can be absolutely marginalized. Marginalized is even too too gentle a way to say it. You can be just shut out or, or clamped down or you can be assassinated, right, for trying to have a voice. So let's hear the Afghan women with the power that they have even now even with this hardship, because that's part of the story. They are describing to us what it means to have women included or not included anywhere in any conflict in the world. Thank you, Ambassador. So we can hear the question from Camilla Vornder. Ambassador Hunt, thank you so much for uh, the depth and extent of your contribution uh, to these efforts. Um, I met you at uh, in Cambridge at the Kennedy School and at your home long ago. It's been a while. Uh, but as someone who worked very hard for Bosnia, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you've said a lot about the ability of women to compromise, which is an amazing thing and clearly so needed. How would you or how are we to reconcile uh, the importance of that with uh, efforts like uh, Truth and Re- uh, Recon- uh, Reconciliation Commissions and ICC prosecutions? And so, first of all, you know how with a, when you're doing something like this, I can see four people. I can see four faces. <clears throat> I, yours has been on the whole time. Uh-huh. And so, and I thought, gosh, she looks familiar. <laughs> That's I so great. Watching, I've been watching, you know, like 
if your eyes would twinkle or if you would be, you know, your brow would furrow. And so you've been my person this whole time. So I'm thank you for really saying glad that. Glad you got to speak. <laughs> but I want to understand better. So I heard you talking about women and the ability to compromise. And then I heard you talking about Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the ICC. Tell me, what so, is the question? Well, uh, uh, compromise <clears throat> can, uh, can bump up against, um, or uh, prosecutions can obviously bump Got up it. against compromise. Got it. Got so, it. Uh, uh, Got what it. Do, yeah. So it, it's the whole peace and, and justice question. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I think that the TRC in South Africa, I think they really got it right. And the Rwandan women were, um, they went to South Africa to look and see how the South Africans had done it. And um, and then, and I'm sure you're, the people who are listening know about, you know, keeping, after you have a dramatic, disastrous situation, the courts aren't set up for that. For that. So you have to have this, this uh, transitional, um, justice system. And women were very, very involved in South Africa in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to an extent that we hardly know. And they were the ones who tended to be the witnesses they, by far. And even at times the men who were alive, they didn't want to go because it, it felt like they I don't know, they weren't being strong or they, they were ashamed of having been, you know, had having had um, these experiences and and uh, the women would go and they would they would stand there and they would speak for their men and <clears throat> and then when it was time to get a constitution the women fanned out all across South Africa met all in all the villages to say what should be in this constitution I mean we we are so unaware of the role and then you go over to Rwanda the women in Rwanda go down to South Africa they come back and they say you know, we're going to put together something. We're going to revive the idea of gachacha, which means on the grass. We're going to bring, I don't know if you were there. I, I went to two or three of these hearings, uh, the gachacha hearings. We're going to have all these guys. They're going to come out I mean, by all these guys. I mean, like two at a time or four at a time. And they're going to stand there and we're going to hear the accusation. Now women can be judges, right? Some of the women will be the judges and 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 these guys are coming and and then um Somebody will say, well, you killed so-and-so or you stole this cow or you whatever. Stealing a cow, as you know, is huge, right? Or you burned down this house or you whatever you did, you killed my three children. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I, he didn't because I was with him. So all the communities there, right? This is so different. No, I was with him. No, you weren't. I know where you were. I saw you. I saw you that day. You weren't with him. And then he says, look, here, I mean, this is what I did. I didn't do that. And then somebody says, I have known you since before you were born. I have known you. I was there when your mother gave birth. And you know what? I know when you're lying and you're lying. I know your face. I know what your eyes look like when you lie and you are lying. And all of us, I mean, you talk about the whole business of women's roles and the whole Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they aren't separate if we do it right. I mean, they are they are really, really bound together. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador, one question. Do you have extra maybe 15 minutes because we have like four or five pending questions? So are you able to take them or we can take them offline as well? So it's uh, depending on your time. What do you prefer? I'm happy to do that. My cat is well fed. I'm doing we we are we are making it here. And uh, uh, but but I also want people to know that if there are three people who want to stay do and the rest of you, uh, you know, class is dismissed and we and we'll keep going. Is that OK, Raji? Thank you so much for your extra time. So maybe I'll take the question from Visaka first, then Rin. Oh. Yeah, Visaka. Uh, I uh, I want to thank Ambassador Swani Hunt. Every time she speaks, we learn so much. And it's so nice to see you, Ambassador. It's so nice to hear you. Learning a lot from you as always. So thank you ever so much. Seeing you, hearing your voice, it's so, so special for me. 
Thank you. Isaka, you know, you've taught me so much um, in terms of what you did when your son was missing and um, and you put together the women in Sri Lanka who were on all having that experience of the missing sons and and uh, going into the jungles with Tamil Tiger and sleeping in the pew of the church and waiting to see what what would happen and, and the women who came eventually out and and met with you all because you weren't so threatening because you were women, right? And this creating that that um, connection among you and and the power that you ended up with because of that connection. How are things going in terms of your the death of your husband? Things are fine, Ambassador, and, and also we are right now we are also um, having a group which we call the Sri Lankan Collective for Consensus and um, trying to engage the government. It's a very difficult government, but trying to engage. And thank you ever so much, because all what you have taught us, I always say, wherever I am, it's because of you. So thank you. I just wanted to really, really thank you ever so much. You know, Visaka, when people say, why do you do this work? It's it's because of you and, and Raja. And I mean, you all are really, um, you're my strength. You're my strength. It's, isn't it interesting how we look at somebody else and say, oh, well, she has all of these things going for her and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And 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 the whole issue of privilege. Uh, Rachel, when we talk about, you know, the, uh, the privilege in our society and people, um, privilege isn't necessarily what you think. I mean, I, I have spent way too much time with rich people. I don't particularly like rich people. And, uh, and, uh, there's this whole idea of privilege that people don't understand that privilege is friendships and it's understanding and it's being tested and it's and it's privilege is when you can have people around you who say boy you screwed up wow wow i'm here for you i'll help you out i'll help you out of the mess you're in but you just need to know don't ever do that again that's a privilege that's a privilege to have people like that um, so let's take a step back and realize that privilege isn't about the United States. It, it, of course it is. And it's, and it's obscene that we have all the vaccines, right? I mean, I get that. I don't want to take away from that, but, but let's understand that, that privilege that we have to build on in our lives is the entirety of who we are. And, um, and the entirety of who I am is really you, Visaka, and you, Rachel, and you, Camila. I mean, it's just, that's the entirety. We are with each other. Thank you. Rin Jibahi, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Raja. Thank you. I mean, thank you, Raja, for inviting me to this wonderful talk. And thank you so much, Ambassador, for this inspiring uh, talk. Um, I'm from Syria also, like Raja, and I work with Search for Common Ground. Um, I'm the gender advisor for the MENA region. And I've learned a lot from what you said today, especially because I work with women and peace builders in the MENA region, and we work on women, peace and security. And um, I've been writing down a lot of what you said. And what really inspired me is what you said about how how you analyze the way that uh, men warlords um, do not want women to be on the table because they don't want them to compromise, which I've seen a lot in the, in the work I do in the MENA region. And I like the way that you said that it's not just about uh, concentrating on women training, but really <coughs> convincing the men to um, be, um, they're the one that we need to convince. And this is my question, is that usually when we find women on the negotiation table, it's usually because of the quota system. It's usually because we have the 30% minimum quota. But are there really, do, do you, in your work, have you, in your experience, have you seen examples where we have really meaningful participation of women where men really believe that women should be at the negotiation table. I'd really like to know from you. Thank you. 
the problem is that men are people and women are people. That's that's our problem, you know. And because we all go into any situation with our our own experiences, these guys are coming out of their own experiences. And so we, even though I make these generalities about men, because you know we all know the social science research that says, well, here's the median, here's here's the mean, you know. And, and there's a difference between how how women and men react about blah blah blah. That's true, but they're still individuals. So my great friend who died recently. Uh, Visaka, I don't know if you know that Luz died, Luz Mendez. Um, anyway, she was uh, in the rebel group in Guatemala and all kinds of horrible things that she saw. And anyway, so the peace talks were put together. UN was overseeing them. And um, so they uh, they had a group. I'm going to make it up. I'm going to say there were 20 in the UN group. Maybe let's call it 10, 10 in the UN group, 10 in the government group, and then 10 of the rebels. And she was in, and these went on for a very long time. She was the only woman, the only woman among the 30. Now that's pretty interesting because 1325 had happened. Beijing had happened. Beijing had happened. And the fact that the UN had zero women. Okay, let's, you know, let's just say all that glitters is not gold, right? And so... I don't know if you know the expression, but it means you got to look behind, right? So, so there's the UN with all male, and then their government is all male, and then they're the rebels. So here's this one woman, and she's trying to get some things put into this peace agreement that are going to be lasting, including that you are responsible for what you did in this war. There isn't impunity. We're not going to start here and then move forward as if nothing happened. You've, we're getting back to the whole peace and, and justice issue here. I'm looking at you, Camilla. You can't tell, but I am. <laughs> and and uh, you know, so she wants to really put this these key things in there because that's how the peace agreement is going to last. And you've got this opportunity. You've got a, an opportunity in this peace agreement to make a big, big, big difference. She wants to get this gender stuff into the peace agreement. Well, so she says to her group, the rebel group, what is it we're fighting for? We've been fighting all this time. And you're saying that we're not gonna put this, this gender piece in here? What are you talking about? Meaning gender equity, equality, safety, you know, et cetera. What are you talking about? So she shames them. They say, okay. Okay, Luce. And then she um, she goes to the United Nations. And she says, you know, some version of what the hell is going on? Like, where are the women? You keep talking about, you know, how inclusive you are and we have Beijing, et cetera. So look at you. So they say, okay, okay, well, all right, we'll, we'll support that. So now she's got, she's got the government forces. And she, how do you get to them, right? She said to me, she said, I looked across and I thought all those hundreds, thousands of hours at that table, there was one man. And when I would say something, he would lean forward. That's about the body language, you know? She said, he would lean forward when I would say something. I thought that was so interesting. And she said, and then he would establish some eye contact. And she said, I got to find out who this guy is. So she did. She found out he was married to a very strong feminist, et cetera, et cetera. And he had a, he was pretty enlightened about the role women could play. And that was the person. That was the person she went to. And she said, we have to get this into this peace agreement. We have to get this, this, this massive change in terms of gender into this peace agreement. It doesn't belong in a peace agreement, but she got it in. She got it in and she did it very, very strategically. I mean, she can she can really lay this out. Great. How to make more gender streaming within this agreement. This is how we can learn from that as well. Yeah. So Lilian, sorry for making you wait. Go ahead with your question, please. Hello, Ambassador. I'm not feeling very well. So my pardon me for not turning on my camera. My question to you is, I strongly believe that I need to get involved as much as I can, whenever I can. I do my part um, whenever I can. Um, I vote. I encourage people to vote. 
to be inclusive. I am a Hispanic female. I want to empower people, become an attorney, do all those things. But I really haven't been able to step into that other level as to getting in contact with women that are powerful and can, that are really moving and shaking things. So I need to know what can I do? How can I get in contact with that? I mean, I obviously I'm part of the UN USA, which is was very important to me, very enlightening. Yeah. But yeah. what else can I do? How can I get in contact with this woman? Should I just go up and say, hello, my name is Lillian? That's better than not saying hello. <laughs> my name is Lillian. I mean, really, I mean, you, you put yourself out there is a big part of it. But you, you ask the other thing is you get into situations where you can ask that question to someone like me. You are, you know, in other words, you just did something. You you got on this call. You you wrote the question. You got your or you put your name out there. You asked the question. And so part of what I want to say, Lillian, is that you have what it takes. I mean, I can tell you right now that you have what it takes because you just did it. Um, I mean, I could go if you and I. Oh, we could we could stay in touch. Actually, where do you live? I live in central New Jersey and I would love to get in keep in touch. I Good. need I need people that are going to help me jump to this ne next level. My dream is to become a UN ambassador. Well, that sounds right to me. Uh, so here's here's what Lillian, I, I was just working on putting together a group. Not a big group, six, eight, six or eight of us. And we would get together and talk, you know, maybe once a month. And I was thinking about um, women your age. And uh, let me find out your information and I'd love for you to be part of that group. We'll do a, a mentoring group. OK, we'll all learn from each other. Yay. <laughs> of course. I mean, you just tell me how I can reach you and I'll give you my information, of course. OK, yeah, let's do that. That's a good we will, we will definitely facilitate that for you on Buster Hunt and for you, Lillian. That's a great outcome. So maybe I will leave the last question for Fredlin. Uh, please, uh, Professor Fredlin, go ahead. Um, thank you so much, investors. So, so thank you for an inspiring talk and just, um, you know, for encouraging our students and for encouraging us. And I think you've actually answered this question. So, um, you know, I really was just asking, given what you said in terms of those who've been able, you know, that women have been marginalized so much um, and that you've had um, examples of women who have wanted um, to be in the space and who have said what they hope to do if they were able to have access to that space. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get some examples from you of those who have been in the space. What you what were some examples of the most powerful um, uh, outcomes when women were at the table. And so you, you've talked actually a bit about some of the things that women have done. And so that, that was my question. Thank you. Right, right. Well, you know, one of the interesting pieces for me was I have a very good friend in Northern Ireland and um, where, and she was Protestant and she was a professor. And uh, so the, the Good Friday talks were being put together to come up with some kind of uh, peace agreement between what seemed like, you know, from the outsiders, like it was a, a religious war. I, I think there's no such thing as a religious war. My doctorate's in theology, by the way, but I don't think there's a religious war. I think there are power grabs. And I think that's what was going on in Northern Ireland. And so anyway, she was in, I, I'm going to say Protestant because that's how they were defining themselves. And, and she had a good friend who was um, a labor organizer who was a Catholic, May Blood. And and so the U.S. was screwing up again. We, we, we were uh, overseeing the talks and wonderful guy, wonderful guy, George Mitchell, who was a senator from Maine, he's kind of a hero to me. He was in charge and um, and they were having all men. And so uh, May and and Monica, May is the scrappy. She's about four foot eleven, you know, scrappy. Um, labor organizer and then Monica, who's very sort of much more refined and um, as the professor. So they went and talked to George Mitchell and said, you know, Senator Mitchell, you've got to have women. He said, well, we're not excluding women. Well, well, yeah, you are. I mean, look, look who's coming to the talks. He said, well, we're not. We're, we're just having the heads of the parties. Now, number one, 
Number one, could we take note that women so often say, oh, I don't need to be the head. I, I'll help. You know, or, or and of course, they end up running it. Right. But they don't get the credit. So if number one, I would say, and this goes back to Lillian, you know, just push yourself forward and insist that you know everything there is to know about anything. Because when I ask a question at Harvard, I tell you before the words are out of my mouth, the men have their hands up to answer it. And I say, women, where are you? And they say, well, we're just thinking about whether or not what I was going to say really makes sense. Or maybe someone else has already said it. OK, so anyway, <laughs> push yourself forward. And so and become the head of the party. If there isn't a party to be the head of, then create a party. OK, so they got themselves to the table by in this way. They said, well, we will put together a party. And he said, well, good for you. Uh, but you don't have time because you know the elections are coming up, and you have, you know, but you have to have a certain percentage of votes, et cetera. Said so that's fine. We'll we'll do that. And he said we, we you don't have time to do it. You, we'll do it. We'll do it. So they go around. May Blood knows everybody. She's a labor organizer. Monica Williams is very highly regarded. She's this professor that and she, they put together. They put together enough names in in like a couple of weeks. There are elections. They get enough votes to be at the table. Now, this is crazy. This is just crazy. And you know what they do? They got stuff in that peace agreement, which is one of the reasons it held, it, probably the reason. They got so many things. They said, you know what? We have to have unified education. Because right now, our Catholic kids are learning one version of history, and our Protestant kids are learning a different one. And that's going to keep this this conflict going. We have to have one, one set of books. It's got to be unified. You know what else? We've got all these guys who've been put in prison. You know how, how that is keeping us from being able, these political prisoners, can't get them out. Everything's, everything is centered around these guys. Release these prisoners. We'll take, the, we'll take them. I'll be in charge. The, we women will be in charge of keeping those guys from, you know, from going, blowing things up, et cetera. They did. They got the release of the political prisoners. They, it, the list goes on and on about what they, as women, did. Everything, she, and one of, one of the things she said, Monica, when we talked, she said, you know, we knew each other because we were all getting beaten up and there were these shelters. She called them refuges, right? They, they were, there were these shelters for battered women. And we were all getting battered. We knew each other. I mean, it, it, just all of these twists and turns. It's just so amazing when you hear these stories. You know, that's how we knew each other. We were all getting beaten up. So we made sure that the kids were all having the same textbooks. I mean, it, it, that's what it is. It gets down to that very specific, uh, concrete way. When you look at it, none of these agreements are alike. There's, there's no cookie cutter approach. You just got to be smart. You got to be determined. And you got to just... Just recognize when you screw up and, and build the relationships. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for that example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for the answers for your question and also for suggesting the mentoring group. We got like many people are interested to join the mentoring group. So we will organize with you, we'll communicate about it and also we'll share with the mm, people who registered for this event. Can we have a final words from you before I mm, uh, conclude the event? Yes, the final word is Raja, I want to hear from you. I want to hear from you about how you're feeling about your work and your experience and what has gone right and what has gone wrong. And um, tell us about your country. Tell us about, I just want to hear from you. I, I'm, there's so much, you know, it's, it's interesting that, you know, you, you say, oh, let's get Swanee Hunt to come talk. And you have so much, you have so much more experience than I do. So I'm, I'm handing you the last question. Terrifying moment, isn't it? So, Roger, you you have you have the floor, Roger. You have the microphone. Thank you so much, Ambassador Hunt, for this opportunity. I 
learned so much from mm, joining the colloquium in uh, 2013. And actually, it was, I think, my first time that I talked a lot about like the detention of my father in the 90s by the security forces in Syria. And when I knew exactly why I joined the forces to document the human rights violations in Syria when the Syrian revolution started, even though I knew that, mm, like I, I promised myself before, it's too dangerous to involve in politics in Syria, I shouldn't do it. My father was tortured and mm, he was imprisoned for nine years away from his family. This is what I went through while I was a child, and this is what I don't want any child, not only in Syria, around the world, to go through. This is why I'm fighting for empowering civil society and also promoting democracy in Syria, but also around the world. And I know that women are a huge force in order to achieve democracy in Syria and also the Middle East and in the world. And I thank you for all the work that you've done for supporting women leaders around the world through the colloquial and through all the work that you've done. And I'm very happy that we were able to have this open conversation, personal, inspirational, insightful discussion with you, Ambassador Hunt. I would like to thank also the organizer, the Center for Peace and Conflict Study, and also the sponsors for our event, the United Nations Association of the USA, UNA USA, and the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. I know it's not the end. I really hope that we are going to pave the road for more women, and I would especially thank you for opening the opportunity for the mentoring mm, uh, mm, sessions with the woman, and we will take it from there. Thank you so much, Ambassador Hunt. You inspire me, Raja. Thank you. You inspired me as well. Thank you, everyone, for participating in this call, and we will keep in touch. We will reach out to every one of you. Thank you. And I hope that you will listen to the video of this recording when we put it in the website of the center, but also we will reach out to you for a future event as well. Thank you again, Ambassador Hunt. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Ambassador. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, you, so nice to see you. Thank, thank you. you. Please see you. Bye. 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 Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Great to see Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Good to see you all and meet with you all. Bye. Fascinating. Fascinating. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Raja. Thank you. Bye.